Revelation, one of the seven letters to the churches. Uh, I wish we had time to look at the whole segment, because this is one of seven letters that make up a complete unit of thought. And all the repetitions don't occur so much in paragraphs. As you go through it, you're not going to see many repetitions in this singular letter, because the repetitions occur throughout the letter. So each letter has like eight repeated phrases that are in all the letters. And when you see that, you start to really see the significance of what Jesus is trying to communicate to the churches. But do you remember the four steps of inductive Bible study? Observations. They make observations. Right? So step one is make observations. And what were the things we were going to look for in the text? Repetition, right? Words that repeat. Where do we want to look for repetitions? In multiple paragraphs. So it's not that significant if it shows up a bunch of times in one paragraph, but if it keeps repeating in multiple paragraphs, that's a much more significant idea. Okay? So we want to look for repetitions. What else? Good. Somebody. Right. Remember causations? Right. And, and the flag words, the, the, the like little flags planted uh, in the text that show you there's something there. Like when I don't know if you've ever been to a construction site and they take those little yellow flags and kind of mark where the gas line is. So you know, hey, there's something here, right? This is what flag words do. They're like those little flags planted in the text. And so for causation, we're looking for words like therefore, so then, so that, or sometimes just so. Does it need to be a big so or it could be a little so? Uh, so typically when we're first, when you're looking at an entire book, you only look at the big stuff, right? Because you'll just get buried in the weeds. You've got three paragraphs today, so have a little fun with it, right? And you can uh, find all those. It's not going to overwhelm you. What's the difference between a big thing and a big thing? Capitalized. Well, yeah, what's the difference? So for example, so causation is what? It's a cause. That produces an effect. Right? So if my therefore is in the middle of a sentence, how big is the cause and effect? It's just one sentence. If my therefore starts a sentence, how big is that causation? Two whole sentences, two whole thoughts. If my therefore starts a paragraph, how big is that causation? It's so big. Huge. If it starts a, a segment, how big is that? Paul loves to do that, by the way. He loves to link whole segments of thought together. Uh, in fact, I'm not sure there's any of his segments that don't link. Uh, so he just builds these humongous ideas. And then there are sections of books, right? You can have a book that breaks down into two sections. Romans is one of them, right? We talked about that. Uh, a couple of days ago, how the first half of Romans is the cause, and therefore, I beg you to present your bodies as living sacrifices. First 11 chapters are one cause, and the following six, five chapters are what the effect that produces. It's just a massive thought, mind-blowing thought. Okay, so we want to, so typically you want to look for capitalized flag words. Uh, okay? What was another thing we were going to look at? Contrast. Contrast. Right? And that's just two ideas that are presented in opposition. And what's our flag words for contrast? Big butts. Big butts, right? Pay <laughs> attention to big butts. Uh, and I don't know if I told you this because it wasn't in the text. This, is not, this one's not in the text either. Nevertheless. Nevertheless, is also 
Uh, and if it just says, sometimes the authors will say, in contrast. <laughs> All right, and that's really easy. Okay. I want to introduce another one to you today. Comparisons, the opposite of contrast. It's two ideas that are presented as similar, right? So uh, some of our flag words will be like, just as, in a similar way. Who loves, who in the Bible loves to use comparison? Jesus. I truly, truly, I say to you, the kingdom of heaven is like, like right? And almost all of his, a large chunk of his parables are, he uses contrast or comparison to make his point. He's comparing the two things to give us more insight. All right, so let's make some observations. Go ahead and scan through the text. Some of you have already been doing that. And you want to circle words that repeat. Causation, our symbol, we put it in the margin. It's just a, a right arrow showing that we're going from the cause to the effect. Right? If uh, to kind of to Chris's point, what about ones that don't start paragraphs or don't start sentences? I do it like that. So I darken the symbol when it starts, when it's more significant, if it's in the middle of a sentence, I just leave it empty like that. All right? And kind of, I can just scan down the page and I can see how significant something is. Contrast. This little C with a circle, like a little copyright sign. And then comparison. I just do that. Right, so admit, those two things are being compared to each other. Okay? Right, so remember, don't read it, just scan it. Probably going to be the only teacher you have that tells you not to, read, to <laughs> stop reading your Bible. Right. You know why I wanted to stop reading your Bible, right? I want you to stop reading your Bible today. I would love for you to all stop reading your Bible. Yeah, I'm serious. This is one of the most things I'm most serious about. I want you to completely stop reading your Bible. Turn to the person next to you and say, stop reading your Bible. Stop reading your Bible. So you're like, I can't say that. <laughs> Until you stop reading your Bible, you never start studying your Bible. Most of you read the Bible with preconceived ideas, and all you have is confirmation bias when you read the scriptures. Amen. And you're not learning anything new. You're like Paul, one of those people that Paul talked about, always learning and never coming to a knowledge of the truth. Mm -hmm. right, so I want you to start studying the Bible. I want you to start slowing it down. I want you to start looking for the things that really matter. That Give you that help you to be able to read and understand the things you're, you're studying. All right, anybody see any repetitions here? Cold pot. What? Cold pot. Cold pot? Is that in two paragraphs? Two sentences. Two sentences. Now, what are we looking for? What are we looking for? Paragraphs. Paragraphs. One that show up in multiple paragraphs. There's one, just to give you a, there's one. Hi. It's like we're not focusing on the personal yeah. pronouns because they're hard to decipher who it pertains to. Cuba? Church. Church, exactly. Church. Everybody see that? All right? Extra big scripts left somewhere lying around the back of the room. Around the whole letter, right? 
So that's it. That's the only uh, repetition we're going to have. The, uh, do you guys like the chart? Do you do the chart? No. Yes. 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 All right, so we just got three paragraphs. I'm just going to do a little picture of this letter. All right, so it's 14 to 18. Okay, so in terms of repetitions, we have church and churches. Okay. What else do you see? Well, there's the, the hearing and ears. Um, here, ears is in two and three, and then you have ears and eyes in one and three. Yeah, so we have a, a similar word, right? Um, eyes so you can see. So this is a little, it's getting a little advanced, so. Uh, but we'll, we'll put it in there, right? Uh, we have ears. This is a little, a little advanced because now we're looking at potential uh, similar concepts, not even similar words, or similar concepts. Uh, but I don't want you to worry about that yet, uh, because then you'll be like, what about out, and <laughs> be, and has, right? Are those, right, you know, so you can get a little out of control with it, but this is a good insight from, from Kai. And three is here and yours. Yeah, here. Ears. Okay. Anything, what else do you see? Besides repetitions, what else do you see? And this, this letter is built more on the other structural laws than it is on repetition. So what do you see? Any causations? Okay. All right, so verse 16, how does that start? So, right, so we got a, a causation in verse 16. Verse 18. Verse 18, I kind of put it there for you, because uh, this is what we call an implied causation. Right, so the, I put it in parentheses and I italicized it because I added the therefore. But you can see how it reads identically. Right? I say to you, you, you say I'm uh, well, but you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, naked. Uh, therefore, I counsel you buy from me with my soul. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. So there's one thing that causes another, so we've got another causation in 18. It's not the beginning of a verse, but the beginning of a sentence, a contrast in 17, but. But it, it is a, it does start a sentence. Yeah, it, does, it starts a sentence, it's not a verse. It doesn't have to start. Remember, verses are just there from the Catholic Church to help in catechism. Uh, that's it. It's got nothing to do with context or any of those kind of things added around the, the turn of the millennia, first millennia. So it, it, it's, a, it's a real contrast, right? A big contrast there. Oh, it's in the basement. Or 17, rather. So it's in between the two. Yep.
about. You've got to sew in 19. You've got, so you've got, uh, yeah, that's what, just, that's what Joyce just brought up, right? right? So she just brought up. So mm -hmm. in verse 19. You've got a, uh, a couple, but you've got three little mini ones inside this one, right? Yeah. Here, yeah, are, my, here are my uh, standing knot, and here's an open. Does that add anything? Yeah, that's what that's what Kai brought up, right? Oh, I didn't hear that. Ears here. Oh yeah. Okay, got right. it. Yeah. Um, so good, good insight. But do you see the three little mini causations inside the big causation of eighteen? Yeah. So you become rich, exactly. So you can cover your shameful nakedness. So you can see. Those are all mini causations, and since we've got the time, let's take a look at them. There's one more structural loss. The new one I, I showed you this morning, right? The comparison. Does anybody see a comparison anywhere? In 21, just as. 21, just as. Okay. It's not. It's not starting a sentence. So I'm going to leave the arrows empty. I'm not going to color them in. But since the paragraph's only two sentences, it's got some, some weight to it, okay? All right, so that's our picture of the, the text. Now what's our second step? So that's all, that's all it takes in doing observation. Pretty simple, right? Right, pretty straightforward, pretty easy, doesn't take a lot of time. Uh, typically, I'll do a book you know, like one of the Gospels, John will take me maybe two hours to do observations for the whole book. Uh, another couple of hours to chart it all out. Uh, and then you've got all your observations laid out for you. All the repetitions, all the structural laws, right? It doesn't take a lot of time. Uh, and so this is what I want you to, to realize, that studying isn't that hard. It's, you just have to know what to look for and then you have to practice it. And that's, the, that's the, the power of spending nine months doing it. Right? I'm gonna go, we're going to go through four whole books of the Bible together inductively. So my goal is that by the end of Impact, you will be thoroughly equipped to open any book of the Bible and be able to understand it for yourself without any commentaries, any podcasts, any sermons. This is going to revolutionize the way you see scripture. And insight is just going to leap off the page of you. Right? And that's where it gets really fun and exciting. So our first, first step is make observations. What's our second step? Ask questions. Ask questions, right? And that's coupled with the third step, which is answer those questions. And where are we looking for our answers? Context. In the context, right? So it's in the context. So if you tell me, well, you know, the Gospel of John says, I'm going to go, well, it's not really our context, is it? Right? Uh, and so we want to start with the immediate context, which is always going to be what? The paragraph that we found it in, right? So if we found a, a causation here, where's our immediate context? This paragraph, right? What's our near context? The segment. The other paragraph. The segment, right? And we'll learn about that. How you, how the chapters are not the, the breaks the author intended. That's just how long. That's the Catholic Church again breaking up the scriptures in readable chunks. So they didn't break it at natural breaks, right? And you guys all know that when Paul wrote or when John wrote. Revelation. There were no chapters and verses in it. You guys know that, right? God didn't write no chapters and verses. So when you get your manuscripts, like when you get the Gospel of Mark, it's just going to be pure text. I'm not even going to give you the verses. Right? It's just going to be written like a manuscript, just like it was when when Mark wrote it. Right? So it's gonna, you're going to have to figure out how to structure it and keep track of where you are in it without any chapters and verses. It's super fun. Super fun. All right? 
Okay, so let's let's talk about the kind of questions. There are two kinds of questions we ask. What are they? Remember? Factual questions and then implication questions. So factual questions are the easy ones because there's always going to be an answer. What's an example of a non-factual question? What do I never want to hear asked? Why? Why? Right? Because now we're speculating. Right? As soon as we do that, then we're just growing our own opinion. And this is just a great principle for life as well. Right? The, the why questions are really hard to answer. But I've learned when hard things happen in life, you don't ask why, you ask, what now? Right? That's what moves you forward in life. Right? Okay, so what's our one repetition? That's the question we would ask about church. God? No, what's our repetition? Church, church right? So that's our, our repetition. What does the word church mean? And you can write, if you want to get good at asking questions, I encourage you when I do this to write down the kind of questions I ask. All right? Because that's how you learn how to ask good questions. So, first question I asked is, what's our main repetition? Second question I asked is, what is the church? What does the word mean? All right? And I just want to make sure I understand when I'm looking at a word that the author is repeating that I actually understand that word. So what is what is the word church mean? Two more words in the No. So the, the Greek word is ecclesia. ecclesia. And what does ecclesia mean? Called out gathering. Right? A called out gathering. That's what the word church means. And you can see how in most people's minds, when they think of a church, what are they thinking of? Building. 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 A place you go. Right? You go into church. Where you go to church. Right? These are the thoughts we have. It's not what group are you a part of, but it's what place do you go. Right? So a called out gathering. Called out from where? Well, does it tell us in the in the context? We'll have to see, right? We'll we'll dig in, we'll study a little more, and we'll see if there's anything in the text that these people are being called out of. Well, you're, you're jumping ahead, but you know, we'll see that Chris is right. But let's get there through study. Okay? Let's get there through study. Now, how does this letter start? Two. The angel of the church of Ephesus. And that word angel is an interesting word. Anybody know what that means? Messenger. Just messenger, right? So uh, it's, it's not like... Your guardian, your church, every church has a guardian angel that sits on the roof at night, and watches <laughs> over the building, anything like that. It's really saying, hey, I, this is a message that's supposed to get delivered. Right? This is a message that's supposed to get delivered. Who's it from? Who's this message to the church at Laodicea from? Jesus. What does it say? The Lord, you amen, the faithful and true witness. Yeah, now if we, had, uh, if we had had a chance to study the whole first segment of Revelation, you would see that John has a vision of Jesus, and Jesus is the one telling him, is, is dictating these letters to him. So it's, it starts with Jesus, but it doesn't just say from Jesus. What does it say? Amen. Right. So it starts with a description, some characteristics of Jesus. All right? This is significant, we'll see later. But how does Jesus describe himself to this church? Because he describes himself differently to each church, which is fascinating in its own right. How does he describe himself to this church? Amen. So three things, right? The amen. The faithful and true witness and the ruler of God's creation. So three distinct.
distinct uh, descriptions. What does the word amen mean? So be it. So what's Jesus calling himself? So be it. Right? So this is from the so be it. Okay. We'll have to see when we get into our implication questions what the significance of that is, right? Because that's where we want to go with our study. What's the significance of Jesus calling himself, thus so be it? Right? What's the, the second thing he calls himself? Faithful and, Faithful and true witness. What does the word witness mean? Somebody who observes. You would think. Right? And here's where. If you're unsure, it's good to go and look, right? So I'm going to give you some resources where you can go look up these actual words. The Greek word here is martus, from which we get our word martyr. martyr. Right? So it's not just an observer. What does the word martus or martyr mean? What does it, what does it signify? Well... Someone who dies in confirmation of what they believe. Right? So it's much more significant than someone who's standing and watching. It's someone, Jesus saying, I'm the faithful, true one who died in confirmation of what I said. So Jesus was so faithful and true to live up to his Father's will that he gave his life for it. What's the last thing Jesus calls himself here? Ruler of God's creation. What does ruler mean? Yeah, kind of control. Sometimes these, they, right, when you get these concepts like ruler of creation, anyone ever heard that before? It's not, it's not a super commonly used phrase in the Bible, right? So whenever you run across something that seems ambiguous to you, what should you do? Look it up, right? This is what it means to study, right? You start to realize there are a lot of words that I don't understand in what I'm reading. I don't realize why it says ruler of creation. So if you looked up the word ruler, it's the Greek arches. And it means the origin of, or the cause of. Right? And so it's not just someone who controls it. What's Jesus saying about creation? Yeah, I'm the cause of it. I'm the source of of everything. I want you to try to keep that thought in mind because that's going to be important when we get to our application. You like founder? More than founder, the, the very cause of it. Like Jesus is saying, I'm the cause, creation's the effect. Creation depends on me for everything. I didn't just start it and turn it over and hire a CEO and let somebody else run it. Right? I am, the, I am the origin and constant sustainer of creation. Okay? Just log that in there. Because all these things are going to be super important as we keep digging in. All right, how's your brain? Brain's okay? Because yeah. right, we're going to take it out of first gear and put it in the second. You ready? Okay, let's, let's dig into our first causation in 3.16. What's the cause and what's the effect? That's the question you would ask. That's the factual question. What's the cause? What's the effect? What's the cause? That's the, no, that's the, that's the effect. What's the cause? Remember, the cause comes before the flag word. The flag word's always in the middle of the cause and effect. <laughs> just, just look at the sentence before the therefore. What does it say? What does it say? Or the so? I'm sorry. You do not realize 
They don't realize okay, so, so what's the, so he says, so, right, he says, I know your deeds, that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other. Right, so that's the cause. What Jesus wants is the cause. Follow this? He's saying, I wish you were either hot or cold. You're not. Therefore, what's he going to do? Spit you out. Spit you out of his mouth, right? So because so the, you're because you're lukewarm, either hot nor cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. What does lukewarm mean? In the middle. In the middle. The, yeah, so think about it. You go to the bathroom. You want some lukewarm water. What do you have to do to the faucet? You have to open them both equally. And that gives you lukewarm, right? It's a mixture of both. Right? It's a mixture of hot and cold. It's half hot, half cold. And what you realize is super important, right? So lukewarm is not... No hot. Lukewarm is half hot and half cold. So is that not identifiable? Because you don't feel the cold and you don't feel the hot. So it's, ident un it's not identifiable. Yeah, kind of. Right? So think about it it's this way. So it's, it's a mixture of both that produce something that's neither. It's a mixture of both that produces something that is neither. Okay? All right, so those are our factual questions about that causation. What's the contrast? Let's move on to the contrast in 317. What's the, what are the two things that are being contrasted, held in opposition? Nope, look at the text. Read it. What does verse 17 say? You say. You say, right? So what do they say? So the contrast is between something they say and something they are. Nope, look at the text. So it's so on one side they they say something, but reality is different. Nope. What does it say? What's the contrast? This is why you got to be important. It's, it's so important. You got to actually look at the text. That's why I want you to stop reading because you're making assumptions. You don't realize. They don't realize. Okay, between what they say and what they don't realize. That's the contrast. They're saying one thing, but they don't realize something else. That's the contrast. Okay, so what do they say? Say you're rich. Say I'm rich. I become wealthy. Poor. I have need of nothing. So three things they're saying. Right? I'm rich. I've become wealthy. And I have need of nothing. What is it they don't realize? <laughs> Five things, right? Wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Right? So, what does it mean to be wretched? If you looked it up, you find that it means suffering, spiritual, or emotional misery. So they say I'm rich, but in reality they're suffering... Spiritual or emotional misery. What does it mean to be pitiful? And this kind of flows out of being wretched. Or pity or one to be pity? Yeah, it, it, says it just means worthy of pity due to your wretched state. Because you're so wretched, you are worthy of being Pity, not envy. You see how this is in contrast to being rich? Because what do we do with the world's rich? We envy them, right? We envy their mansions. We envy 
their lifestyle. We envy their vehicles. We envy their opportunities. Right? And here, the contrast is that you're not enviable. You're pitiful. Right? Now, what does it mean to be poor? Lack of money. Lack of resources, right? You've got nothing to give, nothing to share. Right? Opposite of rich. What does it mean to be blind? Can't see. What does it mean to be naked? Unclothed, vulnerable, exposed. Right? Okay, so those are our factual questions about our contrast. Let's move on to our causation in verse 18. What's the cause? What's the effect? Remember, our, our contrast is the cause. The fact that they don't, they say one thing, but don't realize the opposite, what should that cause them to do? No, not seek counsel, what does it say? I counsel you to to buy from me. Who's the me? Jesus. What does Jesus counsel them to acquire from him? Gold you're finding in the fire. So that what? What would that cause if they actually went and got gold refined in the fire? They would become rich. They would become rich. What's the second thing he wants them to buy? White clothes. White clothes to wear so that it can do what? Cover their nakedness. What's the third thing he wants them to buy? Salve for their eyes so that they can actually see. Okay? This is hardcore. This is going to be hardcore application for us when we get to the end. That's why I say causations usually pack all the application. And everything is in support of that application. Right? So when you see these causations are money uh, for teachers because that's what you want to apply. Make sense? Yes? No? Maybe? All right? Let me give you an example of this just really quick. I really want you to grab this thought. There's a, the opposite of contrast, or the, the companion to contrast was comparison, remember that? There's a companion to causation, it's called substantiation. And it's, it typically has the flag words for, because, right, for this reason, that makes sense? It's substantiating an idea. Think of how many verses we think are major the key verse in a passage that pastors will preach as the verse that are actually supporting cats. For example, John 3.16, how does it start? Or, it's a supporting idea, it's not the main idea. Right? Ephesians 2.8. Or we were created... For we are his workmanship, created for good works in Christ Jesus. That'll get taught as the main idea. It's a supporting idea. What about Jeremiah 29, 11? Everyone's favorite verse. For I know. For I know. That's a supporting verse. That's not the main idea. And if you don't know how to look at Scripture correctly, understand the significance of what the author is communicating, you're going to teach the wrong ideas. Or at best, gloss over the most important ideas. Right? So what's John 3.15? For God, for God so <laughs> <laughs> what's 15? That's the supporting verse. What's the main idea of that passage? <laughs> what's 3.15? No one knows how to do that. Just as Moses, and that, and that links it as a comparison above, right? Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man will be lifted up. For God so loved the world, right? So it ties back to this whole idea of healing, how Jesus is our healer from all the impact.
impact of sin in the world. And he is that healer because God loves us so much. But the big idea is not that God loves us so much. Does that make sense? Yeah. The big idea is that Jesus can heal you from all the, the venomous effects of sin in your life. That's the big idea. Yeah. Yeah. That's the money verse right there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so let's keep going here and see what... Okay. Well, I was going to jump into the next thing, so. Um, um, what was the term you used? Like, because I think it's a contract comparison is to... Substantiation is the opposite of, or the companion to causation. Yeah. All right, so what's the causation in 19?
So it means to, the, the definition is to change one's way of life as a result of a complete change of thought and attitude to sin. I want you to hear this again. This is important. This is, the, this is a mature definition of repentance. To change one's way of life as the result of a complete change of thought and attitude with regard to sin. Repentance is not telling God you're sorry. Repentance is changing your life completely. The reality is most Christians do not repent. They don't experience repentance, they experience remorse. That is not what God calls us to. God does not call us to an endless cycle of remorse and regret. He calls us to a complete and radical change of life. And this comes from a complete change of how you think and how you feel towards sin. So it's like a change of direction based on a changed internal compass, not like an outward action. So what I what I don't like about and I and it, I like that it gets used because it's a simple, easy way. So like if you're talking with kids, the turnaround is a great illustration that they can get. Uh, but it's not just turning around; it's in the turning around you metamorphosize into someone different. That will never go that other direction again. So, will you repeat the original thing? Repent means change the way of life, and what's the next word? To change one's way of life as a result of a complete change of thought and attitude towards sin. Without that, there's no repentance. Right? If you haven't changed your thought and feeling towards sin, you are not going to repent. You are not going to change. If it is still appealing to you, if you are still keeping doors open for temptation, you have not repented. Right? Jesus gave the most vivid illustration of it. He said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's a complete, permanent change that you can never do that thing again. That's what repentance, I'm not saying you should go cut off your hand. I'm saying <laughs> yeah. that it should, the, the effect of repentance should be as dramatic as cutting your hands off. That makes sense? Where there's no longer an opportunity for it. It is a complete change in the way you think and feel towards sin. It's not, gosh, I'm sorry I got caught. Gosh, I'm sorry this is ruining my life. Gosh, I'm sorry this is hurting other people. It's this repulses me. That make sense? This is no longer appealing to me. Now, you guys ready to get into the meat? You guys ready to put it in the dirt here? Yeah. All right, let's ask some implication questions. Here's where it gets fun. What's significant about how this letter started? You remember how it started? With a description of Jesus? You remember that? Yeah. What's significant about that? What's significant of this letter starting with a description of Jesus? He's supposed to be like him. He's coming from him. He's supposed to be like him. Yeah, so the importance, this is important because so often we're so focused on who we are that we lose sight of who Jesus is. Right? We focused on how I'm failing, how I'm struggling, how life is challenging for me, and we, we lose sight of Jesus completely. And he's not the reference point for everything else in our life. What's significant about how Jesus is described? Amen. Faithful and true witness. Okay, so let's start with the amen. What's significant about Jesus saying, I'm the so be it? He's not so much so, he's not so, think about it, the final one is more like Alpha and Omega, beginning and end. He's not saying that, he's saying I'm the amen. But so be it. It's not the I am. He's a true witness. 
We'll get to that one. We're just dealing with the amen. All right, let's just start with the amen. What's significant about that? Come on. Let your brains kind of, I know they're smoking a little bit. <laughs> let's, try to, let's try to really press into this. Remember, what is amen mean? So be it. So when, you, when someone prays a prayer like, God, use us for your glory. And we say, amen, what are we saying? I'm confirming the truth of that prayer and committing to the fulfillment of it. Right? If I say, so be it, I'm saying, yes, that's valid, and yes, I commit to be part of the answer. I can't, if, I don't say, if I am not willing to commit to it, I can't say, so be it. Right? Realize Jesus is the so be it, not the I'm not sure. Jesus isn't the big maybe. Jesus isn't the big I don't know. So get your confirmation. Right? He's the so be it. Jesus stands in contrast. Who Jesus is stands in contrast to our lukewarm wishy-washiness. He isn't the big lukewarm. He's the so be it. My father said it, so be it. you got to die on the cross to save the sins of the world. You've got to experience the sin of the world, even though you're pure, righteous Lamb of God from the beginning, before time ever began. This is what you've got to do to be an expression of my love. So be it. I'm committed to it. But everything Jesus says, we're like, I'm not sure. Go make disciples. Well, maybe. <laughs> make me your life's focus. Well, sometime maybe. I got stuff, though. I got, I got plans. I got things I'm doing. I've got... Uh, maybe when I retire. Right? The great thing I love about retirement, when people say, you know, when I'm done with my, when the kids are gone, <laughs> when I'm done with my career and I'm in retirement, then we'll really focus on serving the Lord. But guess what happens when you get to retirement? Well, then it's, well, you know, when this back issue gets resolved, <laughs> and, you know, oh. it's this health issue, and i got to get this cataract surgery, and... And the retirement's the great push-off because once you get there, there's more excuses to not do anything than at any other time in your life. And it just becomes a pattern of being a lukewarm Christian instead of a Soviet Christian. If we were trying to be like Jesus, we would be Soviet people. We would hear truth, and we would commit to truth. It wouldn't be wishy washy. What's significant about the faithful true witness, martyr? What's he saying about himself? Nothing fake about him, right? Nothing half hearted about him. Right? He's willing to die for what he's committed to. There's no disconnect between what he says. And what he does. See how important who Jesus is, is for this letter? Because what did the church of Laodicea do? What was their big contrast? What did they say? They're rich, but they're not. They're the biggest disconnect. They're not faithful and true witnesses. They're fake, phonies, hypocrites. They call themselves followers of Christ, but they are not. They call themselves children of the king, but they're not. They're living like beggars. They say they serve Jesus, but they don't. They're nothing like Jesus. They're not even willing to inconvenience themselves for the gospel, much less die for it. That's the majority of it. We want God's will to line up seamlessly 
with my desires. And we think God hasn't given us any confirmation. I don't have to say, so be it, until there are no barriers, until there's no cause. And then Jesus is the, the source of God's creation. He's the source of everything. This is going to tie in to... They're getting crazy out there. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's so true! <laughs> uh, Don't listen! <laughs> Run away! <laughs> this is going to tie into where Jesus says, Come by for me. Because I'm the source there is nothing but me that's going to make you rich. There is nothing but me that's going to clothe you and cover you. There's nothing but me that's going to help you see. Alright, let's look at a couple things that I'll let you go watch. Gosh, I wish we just had more time. I wish we had more time. Right? What's our first causation? What's our first causation in verse 16? I wish you were one of the other, but since you're, because you're not, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. What's the implication of being called lukewarm? Okay, well, so first word, what is it, remember? It's a mixture of two things. And in our context, what is that? Lukewarm. Disgusting. It's a mixture of Christ and carnality. It's a mixture of some days you're on fire. You go to church, you're worshiping, you're crying, and you go home, and you go to work, and you become someone totally different. Sometimes you're hot, sometimes you're cold. What's significant about Jesus spitting them out of his mouth? <clears throat> Jesus has no taste for the world. He has no appetite for it. There is nothing appealing about your fleshly appetites to him. Compromised believers are repulsive to Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, what's implied here about what caused them to become born? What did they have a sense of? They're rich. Yeah, the sense of self-reliance. Mm -hmm. I'm rich. I've become wealthy. And then a sense, no sense of need. I need nothing. This is the one of the most dangerous places to be as a believer. Where you feel self-sufficient. And like you don't really need anything. It's one of the most dangerous places to be. I, I don't need that. I'm good. I don't need anything. But what's the contrast in verse 17? Right? They think they're rich, but they don't realize their true state. What's significant? What does that show us? What does it show us about them? Deception. They're self-deceived. They're self-deceived. Right? They look at themselves and they say, oh, we're good. And I love the people, when we study a letter like this, we're like, oh, those poor Laodiceans. <laughs> so self-deceived. But that's not me. I'm more like the Church of Philadelphia. I'm Mr. Brotherly Love. <laughs> What's significant about this? Mm -hmm. 
confirmation bias from the community attorney. Yeah, if you think you're fine, you not. just might be self deceived. It's the people that think they're fine that are the ones that are deceived. When, we're, when we have a sense of self-reliance, spiritual complacency, when we're satisfied with a life that's half godly, half worldly, we're deceived. And we're repulsive to Jesus. Now, this is one of those tough messages you don't usually teach on a Sunday because people get all bad out of shape. <laughs> Because we think, well, Jesus always loves me. Yeah, but it doesn't mean your lifestyle isn't repulsive to him still. Right? This idea that God loves everything about me because he loves me is self-deception. God can love you and hate things about you. It doesn't mean he hates you, but he hates the way you're living hates your heart attitude, he can't do anything else. He can't be holy and tolerant. Remember that for one day? He just can't do it. And what does this contrast cause in verse 18? What should it cause? To buy from you. To cause us to go to Jesus and acquire something from Him, right? If we realize today, if today you're hearing this and you're like, holy cow, maybe I'm self-deceived. Maybe I'm in that place of, of, of half godly, half worldly. Maybe I'm compromised. Maybe I'm repulsive to Jesus and I've been kidding myself. I've been deceiving myself. If you're there and you're like, maybe, maybe that's me, what should that cause you to do? Seek counsel. What does the text say? Go to Jesus. Go to Jesus, right? Go to Jesus today. Right? That's what it should cause. And go to him for what? Transformation. Transformation. To a, get a different kind of life from him. Right? And what does that look like? Yeah, that I'm going to go to him for my significance, for my value and sense of significance in life. I'm going to go to him to cover my shame and my guilt. I'm going to go to him for insight. Think about this. Where are you going for insight? You know, my counseling load with the, the since the invention of Google, my counseling load has dropped dramatically. Because <laughs> people have questions about the Bible, they don't think, oh, I should ask George. What do they say? Hey, Google. We should Google that. Siri. Right? Hey, Siri. Right? Siri's your pastor now. Right? <laughs> right? The answer to everything. Ask yourself, where are you going for insight about life? Is Google the salve you're trying to put on your eyes? Is social media where you're looking for answers? Are you a blog person and you're going after this person, that person, that person to give you spiritual insight instead of Jesus? Are you a podcast junkie? And I love podcasts. They're, they're good in, in uh, a measured amount, but if that's your main source of insight, if you're always listening to podcasts, political pundits, spiritual pundits, and you have short-circuited your connection to Jesus, you're not going to have the real riches. You're not going to have the real covering. You're not going to have any real insight. Can you sit alone with Jesus in your Bible and have insight? Mm -hmm. Or do you weary of it and Google an answer? Go find your favorite pastor and listen to the sermon. Can you see? Can you see spiritually? Or do you need someone to always leave you right hand?
<laughs> my hands are in my pockets. <laughs> <laughs> I, just want, I just want to give you the one, one last significance with the implied causation about therefore be zealous and repent. Because this is really, this is what it's all leading to, right? This is what it's all leading to, is being zealous and repent. Today is about how do you restart your passion, right? How do you restart it? How do you become zealous? Right? How do you be, have that enthusiastic diligence? Remember, this isn't talking about gasoline burning on pavement. What happened? Anybody ever do that as a kid? Right? Or gasoline it out or lighter fluid and light it on fire? No? I used to do that all the time. WD 40 on lines of ants be like, oh, maybe Paul. You know? Oh. You know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> what happens when you light gasoline on pavement? Flush. It burns. It turns to nothing. It melts. All the heat dissipates almost immediately. We think zeal is gasoline on pavement. Mm. Where I'm going to go to a concert, I'm going to go to a seminar, and I'm going to get fired up. You ever thought that? I can't wait for passion or one day. I'm going to go, I'm going to get so fired up. I'm going to go to church and I'm going to get that, oh, my favorite worship band's playing. I'm going to get so fired up. We're going to get so, you know, that was our that pastor's on fire, right? We're like, I'm so stirred up. And then we go to work, and what happened to all the heat? <laughs> just gasoline on paper. Zeal is not gasoline on paper. It's a well-stoked, blazing furnace. Zeal is that inner burn that's well-fueled. It is going to be hot for a long time. That's zeal. That's what we need. We don't need to get fired up with a heat that dissipates in a couple days. We need to be fueled. We need to be stoked. We need that long burn deep inside that can handle the trials and difficulties and challenges and demands of life and ministry where it's not going to get quenched. Uh, uh, a little... Throw a little. I, I used to be an art major. We had to have these big kilns for firing things or smelting, especially when you're like smelting and you're melting down bronze or, or aluminum to cast something. They're white hot. Right? You pull the, the lid back, it's like. <laughs> and it's just blazing out of there. That's what it means to be zealous. That's what it's like when we're with Jesus, when we're. When we're you know, enriched by him when we're covered by him and, and we're not, I don't have shame and sin that's constantly quenching the fire of the Holy Spirit down deep in my bosom. We need a complete life change. I don't know what ever made us think we could accept Jesus' death and then reject his life. How have you ever got that to see? Mm -hmm. That I could accept Jesus' death and not embrace his life on my own. Isn't that what we do? We have no goal to live extremely Christ-like. Right? There is nothing normal about Jesus. Every single thing he did was extreme. Jesus didn't go hand out a couple sandwiches to homeless people. But let's be five thousand. Let's just go extreme with it. Walked on water, he touched lepers, cast out demons with a word, raised the dead. Everything about Jesus' life was extreme. Why are we so in love with mediocre? It's probably because we're more in love with the world than we are with Jesus.
What's it going to take to bring about a real change in your life? <clears throat> so what I've come to realize, people don't repent until something extreme happens to them. Right? I've got a friend who had a heart attack. Guess what it did to his feeling about food, especially fast food, junk food. What did, what did it do to his attitude and thinking about junk food? It brought change. Radically changed it. And now he's into smoothies and kale, and, right? Because he had something extreme happen in his life. Same thing happens. You get arrested and go to jail for drugs, what's it going to do? Hopefully. Hopefully this will be the extreme thing that changes your, your attitude towards sin. The marital separation, right? Your wife can come home and your wife is packed up and left. What's that finally hopefully going to do? Help you get serious about your pornography addiction. Right? Right? So, you know, you need something extreme. Heart attack, jail, marital separation, signing up for impact. <laughs> 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 if you want to see not a continual cycle of remorse, but a genuine life transformation, you need to embrace something extreme. That's what causes transformation. Amen? Amen. All right, good gosh, I have like seven more pages. <laughs> so, keep going. Uh, we're gonna, so you keep going. Lunch. We're going to go eat lunch. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lord, thank you for God, the richness of your word, Lord, the ability to dive into it and to dig into it for ourselves and find insight and understanding and application for our lives. And I pray that you would take all this time that we've been digging around in your word and you have it embed deep into our hearts. We want to be zealous. We want to come to you, Jesus. We confess today that we're, we're wretched, we're pitiful, we're poor. We've got nothing of heaven to share with anybody. And we need you to give us that richness and significance, that value, that fullness of your kingdom. God, we need to be clothed in your righteousness. We need to be able to see with your eyes. And I pray that you would bring about this transformation in everyone that's here today. We trust you for it. Bless our food and fellowship at the tables. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.